and this business will continue to innovate and modernize beyond my time. What I'm looking forward to doing is being a, you know, holding the baton and really trying to move this business forward in my tenure and really adding value to what we do. We've got such committed people, such talented people, probably some of the best people I've ever worked with at Insisk. You know, we need to respect the past, but we need to just have one foot in the past and one in the future. I'm Paul Brown, CEO designate for the business. I'm a civil engineer, been in the industry for too long to mention, but certainly 28 years, primarily in the UK, but more recently spanning both the UK and Ireland in a role managing director of civil engineering and then ultimately as chief operating officer for UK construction and civil engineering. Welcome to Inside Sisk a podcast series brought to you by John Sisk and Son, where we meet the people behind the projects. I'm your host, Patrick Hawhey, and on this final episode of Series 1, I meet the man taking on a very special project, that of leading Sisk into the future and building on 160 years of success. Paul Brown already knows Sisk very well, having spent several years in the company in various leadership roles. We sat down in late October 21 just days after his appointment as CEO designate, and we talked about his vast experience in his career to date, what most excites him about the construction industry, and his vision for what he can achieve with and for CISC in the years ahead. Here's just some of what's to come. Probably the nature of me as a character, I I probably sucked up that responsibility. I had lots of sleepless nights around, am I able to do this? I certainly went there a boy and came back a man. Performance management in the business is a two-way process for me. Have discussions, clear discussions about what good performance is, what bad performance is, on a two-way basis, both both ways, them to me, me to them. And we contract on that kind of model. Yes, I might have been a decision maker in part of the process or the ultimate decision maker, but there were really strong supporters who helped us with those issues at the time. That to me gives me the confidence, it's the strength of those boards, the strength of that challenge, that gets you through those times. Nowadays, the look at the roles we have, planning, DPD, BIM, data analysts, the opportunities for people here are, are, are vast and we need to just make sure that we open up those opportunities for our people and the new people coming into the industry. Paul has had a fascinating career in the construction industry, both in CISC and before he joined the company. So we went right back to the start to kick off the conversation and chatted about where he's from and how we got started in the industry. You can probably tell from my accent, I'm, um, I'm from Liverpool. Uh, my kids say I've lost the accent. I have a very strong work voice, <laughs> but uh, no, the accent is still there. I'm from Liverpool, um, brought up there, schooled there and went to university in Leeds. Uh, in in the early 90s um, travelled all over the UK working um, I guess nomadic existence as civil engineers tend to do back in the day and then settled back in the northwest of England but undertaken a series of national roles and as I say m- last eight years with, with John Sisk obviously What was it that um, drew you to civil engineering in the first place? Um, interesting I was actually um, in August before I started my university degree I was due to study law at Liverpool University and I I, I often think back I ended up studying civil engineering in Leeds now I I, I often think back to that decision making process and I I, I can't actually recall the trigger that made me do that I think civil engineering was always on my radar I was a strong mathematician um, had a sense that I wanted to be a lawyer but I think with civil engineering the one thing that always attracted me was that ability to travel and the ability to take that skill overseas. Mm. And I guess ultimately that's what, I mean, it wasn't built on much the decision-making at the time, yeah. but civil engineering had that and had that in spades. And uh, I was attracted to that. And, and, I, and because I'd left it so late, I was ultimately left in a clearing situation and found a, a place at Leeds University to go and study civil engineering. So um, it's interesting, I'm, I'm holding my own kids to account now about the decision-making process for what they do around uni. I'm a bit hypocritical <laughs> because there wasn't much, <laughs> found, there wasn't much foundation to my decision back then, <laughs> but that's, that's another story. Very um, good. So when you were, when you were in, in uni and you're studying civil engineering, did it feel right from the start? I, I, would, say, I would say the academic side of it was a, was a real challenge, the civil engineering degree, very, very, very math-focused. Math 
Um, what I realized very quickly in the civil engineering degree is how little I actually knew about what a civil engineer was. And I was learning on the hoof. And um, what, what, it, what the technical side of the degree gave me a strong sense that I wanted to be a contractor and not a consultant. You know, you have two, two opportunities to go as a civil engineer. You know, back in the day, you either to work for a, a consulting firm practice or you became a contractor. And that was very, very clear to me that the life I wanted in civil engineering was on, on site, building stuff on projects and that ability to travel. Um, so I was very, very keen to do that. Technical side of the degree was, was a challenge, um, but, but it was very maths focused. Um, did, it, did it back then prepare me for the industry? Probably not actually, because I came out of university and was I well schooled in what a contractor was going to be? Not at all. So you know? what what did you? What was your first um, position after you left? Uni? I, came, I came out of university um, into a, into probably a, a fairly significant recession in the UK, and you know, um, big pool of people, limited opportunities, and I was very very fortunate. Probably the most defining moment in my career was I was given an opportunity to go and work in Singapore. And I, I, I took an opportunity to go and work for an organization called Gammon, who were in joint venture with a Singaporean contractor. Um, and off I went, at the age of 21. And I spent two years working in Singapore, probably uh, given responsibility ahead of my time. But with hindsight, really gave me a platform to develop. Um, probably the nature of me as a character, I, I probably sucked up that responsibility. I had lots of sleepless nights around, am I able to do this? Um, not only the technical side of the job, it was coupled with some of the social issues there. You know, we had, you know, the, the project I was on had 400 operatives living on site in, in porter cabin. When I say porter cabins, I mean containers, glorified containers, which was a real eye-opening experience. But technically, the, the experience really, really accelerated my development. Um, I probably made a decision six months before the end that I needed to get back to, let's say, the UK, because I felt I needed, whilst I'd had some fantastic experience, I needed some real schooling in, let's say, a training path. So I made I made a decision 18 months in that I was going to return to the, U, the UK, get on a training program, become a chartered engineer, that normal route, which I wasn't getting there. Two years in Singapore made me a much more marketable employee. Really? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I came. I mean, I, I, I often, I often use the example. I, I certainly went there a boy and came back a man. Let's yeah. put it that way, quite simply, because of the experience I'd had. I would say the two years I had there was probably equivalent to five in the UK, yeah. in terms of responsibility, yeah. accountability, and genuine experience. You know, often when we're when we're given such responsibility so young or so fresh into a job, and we're learning so much so fast, it's not easy. Um, and do you recall, you know, sleepless nights, uh, the stress, the the really that those feelings of not being able to actually do this and imposter syndrome, whatever comes with that? Hundred percent. And and I think if I if I just t- talk back to that experience, I was probably very fortunate in that I I had a project director. Uh, it was a Singaporean guy called Stephen Lee, who worked for Gammon, who was a great mentor for me. And he, he took me under his wing. I mean, he took he took a number of people under his wing. He had a number of, let's call it graduates, but spent an awful lot of time with us, helping us. You know, those sleepless nights, open door policy very much about challenges. And that's probably something I've taken into my career is because, you know, we, we need to give our young talent opportunity, responsibility. I won't say give them sleepless nights, but give them that opportunity to develop, but have the safety net around them. Now, this guy had it in abundance. You know, he understood it. He pushed us intentionally. Some failed. Don't get me wrong, maybe the sleepless nights were, were too often at times, but I always felt I had somebody to go and deal with it, bounce it off, understand. And I think that's a lesson I've taken into my career, and certainly a lesson I'll take into this role now is you know, our, our talent, our, our succession planning, our talent for the future is absolutely crucial to whatever strategy we take this business on. And we have to test them. We have to test them in a controlled way, but there has to be a little bit of tension in that testing because without that, they won't develop. And, you know, the good people and the really people who are striving for that opportunity will demand that challenge, you know, and I think it's about having the safety net and support around them so they feel they can make a brave decision without consequence. 
giving people that responsibility involves a huge amount of trust and letting go from you or from the leader, whatever manager that is. Did you ever struggle with that? Was there, did you, in your early days in, in your career, find it hard to give over that sort of responsibility and let go a little bit? And was there a point then when that started to change? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I think as I moved into middle management in my career, when I came back to the UK and became, let's say, a project manager running your own projects, the the the, the challenge was transitioning from knowing every infinite detail on the project and wanting to touch and feel it to having to let go, and that's a challenge that that flows right through your career. It's a challenge I've got today, moving into a CEO role. You know, it's it's no different. Um, at different stages of my career, I've held on to things much, much, much longer than I should have done, um, and I probably in, a, in more recent years I've 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 learnt an ability to let go, and to empower people a lot more because it's absolutely crucial and vital. Not necessarily even the younger talent here, just just direct reports, being absolutely crystal clear about what the expectation is for them. I think is fundamental. You know, we talk about performance management in the business. Performance management in the business is a two-way process for me. You know, it's something I do with my staff now, my direct reports in the UK in my current role, is have discussions, clear discussions about what what, what good performance is, what bad performance is, on a two way basis, both both ways, them to me, me to them. And we contract on that kind of model. We understand what the boundaries are and our, our aspiration between those meetings is to go and behave within those boundaries. And that's just a conversation. You know, that's a conversation I like to have with staff on a regular basis. But certainly Certainly in my younger time, going back to, yeah, I mean, look, that, that transition from owning and wanting to understand every infinite detail of the project to letting go to people is a real challenge. And I see it now in even our business. You know, I see I see reincarnations of myself in people, the way they behave. And, and look, we need to help them on that journey because, you know, we're only travelling in the same, they're only travelling in the same steps as us. And we need to help them with that challenge because it's it's a, it's a natural challenge wanting to hold stuff wanting to be master of everything we can't be mm-hmm. you know we just simply can't be yeah. um, things don't get done things just don't get done and you know there's no resilience there's no resilience somebody falls over we're left you know hanging you know we're left we're left, we're left short um, we just can't afford that to happen yeah you went from Singapore back to the UK and then uh, what ultimately led you to SISC Wow. Well, there was a long time between me going back to the UK from Singapore and joining Cisco. Was there? There's a few different roles in between not or many, a few not, years. Not many. I I, um, I joined a company called John Molem when I came back. to. They were uh, actually no longer in business. They were actually bought by uh, Carillion, who are actually no, no longer in business. But that's a long story. Uh, John Molem were a PLC, fantastic organization, probably at the time turning over around $3 billion a year in the UK. So, you know, a, a top 10 contractor in the UK actually known as London's builder the old John Molan was known as the London builder you know because in the back in the day he was he was the go-to but very similar to probably the CIS story but in London back in the day Molan gave me a fantastic opportunity to develop from medium sized to large scale projects and in, in 2006 I was a project director there so I was a young youngster really in my in my believe it or not in my early 30s and I made a decision I made a decision to leave because I was approached to join Balfour BT. I was given a, an opportunity to go and run two very high profile projects in my hometown of Liverpool uh, to build a cruise liner facility on on the waterfront and to build a new canal right through the front of the, the Three Graces, which is the uh, Liver buildings. So two contracts simultaneously running together. And I joined Balfour BT in 2006, a, another big PLC. And I spent seven years with Belfort BT. And in that time, in the first two years, I was promoted from project director to managing director to run the business in the north, civil engineering business. And I spent a number of fantastic years there. And then I was approached in 2013 um, to join CISC, um, completely out the blue. Um, What attracted me to the opportunity was a bit of a blank canvas the opportunity was we, we'd had activity in the UK in civil engineering now we had a business in the UK but it was a building business primarily in London and Birmingham but the aspiration was to grow a 
business in the UK, a civil engineering business in the UK with roots in the UK. What 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 the Irish team had done is they they they've been very successful at picking off the odd project from Ireland. We call it a fly in fly out model. You know, don't get don't don't underestimate the successes we had with Crossrail. The guys had you know, projects for um, in Scotland, in Wales, but it was a fly in fly out model. It wasn't a long term plan. So I was brought in, and I was excited by the opportunity to put down some roots and organically start building a structure and a business in the UK. A civil engineering business, which, which we've done. You know, if we fast forward to 2019, you know, the business had some projects. It was it was projects from Ireland in 2013. By 2015, we had we had a structure. We had a work winning team. We had a business development function established um, in the UK, working very strongly with the Irish team here in Dublin. And around 2016 and 17, we just parted them away because the, the UK entity had grown to a certain gravitas and could stand on its own two feet. And probably sat here today is a re- real success story for us. The business is sat at you know just over 200 million a year. Um, probably between the civils and rail unit now, 300 employees. Um, been really successful. Uh, really proud of the development that's had. And... and uh, you know, in 2019, I, I sort of left that day job role to become COO uh, when Steve decided to, I guess, to restructure the business slightly. The business had grown to a certain level and volume across all jurisdictions and was, was ready for a kind of restructure. And I was given the, the opportunity to be COO for the UK and the civil engineering businesses in both, obviously, UK and in Ireland. So my old job became part of my current job, just one one element of it. Yeah. So, um yeah, it's it's been a fantastic time, fantastic journey with Cisk. Um, been challenges along the way. You know, we've closed down some difficult contracts in the UK um, over the years. You know, with help from the Irish guys over here who helped us close those down. But we've, you know, we've got we've now have a business. Certainly, in, 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 I'll just talk about the UK for a moment. In my my current role, we have a business that all businesses are are contributing to the bottom line, which is good. Um, we've got. Businesses now with a with a good trajectory for control growth, whether that's revenue, not revenue only, but certainly bottom line. And more importantly for me is we've we've evolved certainly over the last two years a, a, a much more coherent culture amongst the four business units in the division, which is really important, you know, because without that culture and without that the people being behind the direction of travel. We have, we don't have a lot, you know. We have, you know, I, one of the key things I did in the divisional role was try and br- try and bring four different business units together to try and create even a board level a common culture mm. and a common vision for the division. And, and and I think we've been relatively successful. One of the things I focused on early early was 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 trying to un- trying to sell to the business units my board how we're organically all battling peddling off trying to do our own thing without doing it consistently. So whether that's DPD, so digital project delivery, you know, at one point we had every business unit trying to get themselves up to speed with conforming to our DPD processes. So what we actually did is we, we looked at centralizing that a little and saying, okay, look, look, rather than us all be peddling hard to make it work, let's have a look at what works from a divisional perspective and then sell it back into the businesses. So, you know, it's, we, we, we're very good in the business in, in these style is, is organically growing teams and developing whether it's social value, DPD, BIM, growing big teams to serve our own business unit. So what we actually did is took a little bit of a helicopter view from it and looked at it from a divisional sense and then sold it back into the MDs. So first of all, it's the hearts and minds of the MDs getting them bought into it, which can be challenging at times because, you know, they're very strong characters and they should be. Yeah. They've got responsibility. But then also, then also just opening conduits of communication across the business units at various levels. So whether that's pre-con teams, having forums together, business development leads, sharing opportunities and leads, understanding each other's pipelines. You know, we have monthly pipeline reviews where, where I, you know, individual business units now historically would only really understand their own pipeline. They now have got a good oversight of the divisional pipeline. So, for instance, our civils team will have a good idea of what our builders in the south are looking at, and if there's opportunities for synergies and cross-selling, you know, we're much better, much more agile to do that. So, really, a hearts and minds approach at all levels, and then you know you've got to sell the you've got to sell the benefits to people. 
you know, what's the benefits of this collaboration? The benefits is, you know, we come together. When we come together, we're really strong. You know, and we really tackle some opportunities together as business units. More to come, absolutely more to come. You know, some fantastic opportunities in the data centre market for our civils team and our building teams to come together. Same in life sciences. So, we now having that visibility and of, of the wider opportunity has really, really brought the businesses together. And, and again, that's going to be my sense in the new role. You know, with the Irish teams and the European teams, is really kind of just we need the silos, but we just need to take a few courses off those sil- silos and get them, get that collaboration across the group. You've mentioned some of the companies you worked with before you joined Cisc. Yep. Now that you're a number of years in Cisc, what's different about Cisc to the companies you worked with before? Well, it's in- it's interesting because um, what's different about Cisc? Um, I would say, the, okay, let me let me start with the difference, and I'll go back to how they're similar, actually, because one of the one of the key differences for me is if I if I could if I could sum up my experience of Cisc is I, I feel like I've genuinely been supported in nearly all of the the ideas and strategies that I've wanted to develop in the business. That doesn't mean people bend over and agree to them, but I've been supported in everything, and that support also sometimes means you you just you've just had the audience. To express your views doesn't mean we've we've signed off on everything. The business is always looking to. I always feel is always looking to improve what we can do uh, in a positive way, and 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 in doing that, they they give people the opportunity to go and create that value. You know, whether it's an MD of a business, whether it's a, whether it's a regional director somewhere, whether it's a new stream of business, whether it's you know we just opened like Cisco Interiors in in Ireland East. You know, there's an idea spot born from something there. The business has listened. And we're off and we're developing that process, that strategy now yeah. in Ireland East, looking at fit out. The business listens an awful lot more than I guess other organisations. And we, we, you know, we whilst we beat ourselves up a lot, I would actually say we're, we're, we're relatively agile compared to others. Um, and that's only because I've worked in PLCs, Balfour BT and John Morland, where look, that agility is, is, is to nowhere near to the same extent. Because there's so many more hoops to there's jump so through many before. More hoops to jump through and. Um, we beat ourselves up thinking we're not very agile in Cisc. Actually, I think I think we are, you know. And I think our decision making processes are fairly lean. Um, we have what I would call appropriate governance. Not we're not too heavy. Now some might have other opinions because I guess we've moved the governance has, has increased over the years, but only to a level where I think it's totally appropriate now. Um, if I go back to the the the, the, the similarities with the organisations, was the organisations have worked. I mean, organisations are, are people. Let's let's make no mistake about this. And the the area of John Molan that I worked in, and the area I worked in Balfour BT felt very similar to CIS because of the values that were important to the leaders in the business or that element of the business. You can, if you went into Balfour BT now, you and, and any big PLC or organisation, you could certainly get ten or twelve different cultures at play because of the scale and size. It's and all I would say is the people I worked with in Molan. And the people I work with in Balfour BT who set that standard and, and, and I guess cast a shadow in the business were very similar kind of leaders that would have added value in the CIS business. They were very quite entrepreneurial, very keen to add value, uh, very keen not to add risk to the business. And the only difference is their ability to make some of the changes that we can, can happily make in CISC were slightly hindered by the fact that they worked in a PLC structure. And that, that was the major difference. That's one of the beauties of working here is that that we have that ability to to make change when we want to make change. And you know we've got to, we've got to validate the change. Uh, but more often than not, we're listened to. That's really important, and people are listened to when they have good ideas. Well, across this series of of interviews, almost everybody has talked about the opportunities that CIS gives you. So it's very much mirroring what you just said, and what has as, what has also shone through is the fact that getting those opportunities is what contributes to people staying so long in a company. So I guess it's central to talent retention, to put the official title on it. Yeah. yeah. Well, look, look uh, probably the, the biggest challenge we've got in the business, I would say, is t- attracting talent, retaining talent. And, you know, I've just been in the meeting this morning, actually, with HR Director Sean Fitzpatrick. And we, wanted, you know, we spent half the meeting, we're talking around that whole piece very early early discussions about how we're going to structure and set up next year to try and really tackle that as a number one priority because the you know the markets that we're working in currently in both Ireland and the UK primarily are hot 
You mm. know, when I say hot, is that we're under we're under attack as well for our great talent, and we need to we need to provide the opportunities for people. We need to make them visible. You know, we're off doing a competency framework at the moment. Now that competency framework in the business in in, in days gone by, that competency framework and that career path was vertical. I see it now, lateral, left, right, up, down, diagonally. We need to make sure people understand that anything is p- possible for them. You know, they need competencies, but they can go left, right, up, down. People shouldn't be pigeonholed in, in roles. You know, the, the the industry we work in today is completely different to the industry I came into many years ago. You know, in those days, you're an engineer or a QS, and if you're a QS, you maybe become an estimator. Nowadays, the, look at the roles we have, planning, DPD, BIM, data analysts, you know, the, 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 the opposite, and, and it's only going to grow. You know, we've got net zero, agenda, carbon, sustainability. The opportunities for people here are, are, are vast, and we need to just make sure that we open up those opportunities for our people and the new people coming into the industry. So they see us as quite a progressive organization, you know, a modernized business. You know, for me, one of the key things for me in the strategy going forward will be to absolutely preserve our legacy but to modernize modernize our business to face the challenges we've got in the market. Yeah. And that's 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 not going to be an easy challenge, but it's one we we need to tackle. Absolutely need to tackle because our people are absolutely you know, I, I delivered a strategy I delivered an outline strategy in, in, in the process to become CEO. You know, by no means is that signed off. But number one of my strategic priorities was around people and culture. That's the first strategic priority that we need to tackle in this business. And that's not only the people in the business, it's the people we want to bring into the business too. Well, you mentioned um, the the new role of CEO. Um, mm-hmm. How did you find out that you got it? Um, <laughs> uh, a phone call uh, from, from, from the chairman. Um, I, I can't remember the exact chronology. We'd had... We'd had uh, a three-stage process of interview. It feels much, much, much longer than that. Actually, it's been a number of months, I guess, of different types of, I guess, assessments in your day job. I mean, for me, I focus. I try to focus on the day job. I mean, at the end of the day, I had a very important, fundamental job to do as COO in the UK, which, I st- which we still have to do. Um, but I, we had a three-stage formal process, which culminated in maybe forty-eight hours after the final stage, a phone call from the chairman. Um, and then, and then a final meet with the family. The next day, I flew over to Ireland and met, met with the family council. And then that was that was all confirmed on the Wednesday, a couple of weeks back now. Uh, so yeah, delighted, absolutely delighted, and, and and you know, been overwhelmed by the support uh, from not only from all levels in the business, but certainly from my local peers. Currently, been really you know from from Donal and Mark, really really unequivocal support. You know, and you know those guys were in the process too. So it's credit to them. I guess for, for giving me that support in the certainly in the last two weeks and I've been working with them about how we shape the business going forward. You know, we're early stages, but we'll, we've got road shows in a couple of weeks. You know, we can maybe give give people a little bit of an insight into the future strategy there. Um, but no, delighted by the opportunity and I've been had nothing but support from Steve and, and the chairman, the family, and all levels of the business. So, and I would imagine that support is 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 very important, and it's important that it continues because we often hear about the role of a CEO. It can be lonely, you know. The book stops with you. I know there's board structures, etc., but it, it can be a lonely position um, when when the book stops with you to a certain extent. Uh, so, it's important to have people around you who you know have your back. A hundred percent. I mean, look. I mean, the, the, the first and foremost, you know, if I if I look at my current role, you know, my my UK board have been that those people around me you know you know a really really grown a good strong culture with them that we have really open and frank discussions with each other and challenge each other the construction board which I've been part of here with Steve you know we've really evolved in the last two years as a, as a, as a, as, a, as individuals as a, as a collective and and there's more work to do there but you know we, we certainly have each other's back you know we've been through a really challenging two years of covid um, inflation brexit challenges in the market my god um, you know we, we've we've done remarkably well not that not as a board as a business but that's because people have worked together you know at all levels and people have had each other's back but yeah it will be lonely I'm guessing it will be lonely at times you know Steve is here you know Steve, I take over on 1st of January but Steve will be here into the new year you know so we'll be using that experience you know his tenure you know he's done six years in this role it'd be foolish to lose that on day one that experience and I'm not I'm not um 
I'm not arrogant enough to say that I won't need it. I'll need help. I need support, and I need help support from my immediate board. You know, around you know, absolutely need all their support in in the coming months together. But uh, I know collectively and individually we've got a really strong team. Yeah, you know, I'd imagine the your ex- the experience of of getting you know you mentioned Singapore and your early days in Singapore and you know extremely tough couple of years, but you got through it. And I would imagine. I was like, by the way, don't I don't want to draw. A really exciting two years as well. I mean, things you know, taking off from Liverpool, I became learned how to do scuba diving. Oh yeah, <laughs> spent weekends in a Indonesia. No, don't get me wrong, we had a lot of fun as well. It was fantastic. It wasn't all work. Yeah. No, so it was a great life experience. Yeah, but that's when you come through. When you come through periods where you're learning so much so fast, yeah. and you survive, and then you do it again, and you survive. So you, you've built up this cachet of of confidence and resilience Correct. to take you to where you are now, and that will get you through the next few years as well. And that Correct. must be awfully uh, comforting for you. Yeah, I think that's it. You know, you 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 look at your, you look at your challenges in your life. And when I was preparing, I guess for the CEO process. You reflect on some of those challenges that you've overcome, and you you know it's sometimes quite refreshing when you look back and think, "Wow, you know, it's it's very very rare and seldom do you take the time to reflect on some of the big challenges you've had in your career and how you've overcome them." And the common thing with them is you never overcome them all on your own. That's the key thing. When you when I actually look back at it, yes, I might have been the decision maker in part of the process or the ultimate decision maker, but there were really strong supporters who helped us with those issues at the time certainly in my latter career in senior management and 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 that to me gives me the confidence it's the strength of those boards the strength of that challenge that gets you through those pro- those those times you know and I, I just reflecting on the last two years you know some really difficult decisions needed to be making a construction board level up to the family and up to Seacon people related decisions some people might say we never got them all right but most most certainly we probably didn't but you know, you know what? There was a lot of challenge at our board around them, a lot of healthy challenge, and, and ultimately, when you look back, we we actually we actually did okay. You know, we actually did okay. We kept the business going. We tried as best we could to look after our people, um, and it was the strength of that board. And not everybody agreed all the time, but we had to have the challenge. The challenge was there. Ultimately, Steve had to make some decisions as CEO, but we were, once we made a decision, we were all in it together. We're all that's that's the difference, and we all we're all collective in that in that in that direction. Yeah. Final question: um, You've mentioned just some of the huge opportunities and challenges and everything ahead in the construction industry. What excites you most about the industry right now? Is it new technologies, new ways of building? Is it trying to bring new people into the company? Is there any, any one thing that would really sort of get get you up in the morning, as they say, and really excite you? I, I think. Look, I, I talked about people, so I won't go back over the people side of it. But people is the business. You know, like, don't get me wrong, people is the business. So I'm not going to gloss over that. But I think I think we have a real opportunity and a moment in time to, I'll call it, modernise our business. And when I say modernise our, modernise our business to face the challenges that we face in the market. So, you know, sustainability and climate is here. It's not here just in construction. It's here in the world politically. Net zero, and 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 the net zero challenge we're going to face not only not 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 only in the UK and Ireland in Europe. I think we've got a real opportunity to differentiate ourselves in that space, and linked to that becomes our offsite strategy, because ultimately they're all interlinked. Net zero is linked to our off-site strategy so our MMC our modern methods of construction we've got vision built you know we're going to be looking with with Mark around how we can evolve that service over the years to really modernise our offering you know so I think that will also create fantastic people opportunities um, again expanding our portfolio of what we do um, and I just see with that technology is going to be absolutely fundamental you know you, you look you look at the progressive steps the business has made in recent years the industry is making and we need to make a step change in the next three years in how we address our technology, not only in our business, but how it serves our core offering in construction and in the services we offer out in the business. Like As we say, it's, 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 it's a 160-year-old company, and if you look back to the very early days, it was always about embracing innovation and the technology at the time or expanding from Cork into Dublin and across Correct. Ireland and all that kind of stuff. So it's you, you, it's probably interesting for you to look back at those times and see, well, you, you're now taking the, the baton, as they say, and continuing the history. Hey, look, I've read, I've, I've read the book. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the podcasts were really helpful, by the way. <laughs> Listen to those in the hotel room over the last few weeks. It's been really helpful too. But, you know, it does 
crystallise you know it's, it's it's preserving that legacy but just modernising our offering you know and I think that's completely in line with the values of the business you know we need to respect the past but we need to just have one foot in the past and one in the future and this business will continue to innovate and modernise beyond my time you know and that's absolutely you know, what I'm looking forward to doing is being a you know holding the baton and really trying to move this business forward in my tenure and really adding value to what we do you know because we do we, you know we're, we've got such committed people such talented people probably some of the best people I've ever worked with at Insisk I say that honestly um, across the business in UK and Ireland and also in Europe obviously but I mean when I say UK and Ireland the, the Irish guys who are working in Europe come under that banner some of the best people and most committed people you know people who jump on a flight and go and work for Sisk. You know, so we, need, we really need to harness that in this strategy going forward. Thanks to Paul Brown for sharing his story, his passion for the industry and his vision for John Sisk and Son under his leadership. I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode and indeed the series overall. If you did, Please follow the series on Spotify, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, and leave a rating and review. To find out more about John Sisk and Son, the iconic projects that the company builds, and the people behind those projects, some of whom you met on this podcast series, visit johnsiskandson.com. Thanks for listening. <laughs>